So there's too many to talk about. The biggest fear is tomorrow. The biggest fear, to be honest, is tonight. What, what will happen to every night? We have to ha answer the question. What will happen tonight? What villages, what cities are they going to the IDF coming into? Who's going to be arrested? Uh, and then the next fear is, how do I get to work in the morning? Are the settlers on the road that I'm going to? There's a new program now on our radio station, which gives a settler report. Many of you probably have traffic reports where the traffic is in the morning. We have settler reports. There's a 50 settlers blocking this road. The settlers left here. If you want to go now, you can get through. It's, it's crazy. So there's a, what I want to say, there's an intimate, intimate, imminent fear of the here and now, whether it's now, tonight, tomorrow morning, how I'm going to get home from work, how I'm going to go to school, et cetera. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a source of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I want to welcome you to this, the first of a series of webinars, the Stones Cry Out virtual delegation, following up on our in-person delegation in Palestine this past February and March. These webinars, and let me share the screen with you here. These webinars this summer are designed to inform, inspire, and empower our advocacy this coming September 23rd to 27th as we gather in Washington, D.C. for meetings, direct actions, demonstrations, and other important gatherings. Mm -hmm. As you can see, our next uh, two webinars are with Omar Harami from Sabil. Palestinian Liberation Theology Center on Monday, June 17th, and then with Kairos Palestine's Rifat Cassis and Reverend Munther Isaac that same week, Thursday, June 20th, and all of our webinars begin at 1 p.m. I also especially want to say thank you to my partners in our planning team for this series, uh, Doug Thorpe. I see Doug on here. Uh, thank you, Doug, for all the work you've done, and Mark Braverman. And I also want to say thank you to uh, our sponsoring organizations listed here. And so you can see we have many organizations listed here for you to see. And we appreciate uh, their sponsoring and their advocating for us and their sharing uh, these webinars with their members. It's our honor today to speak with our friend, a uh, friend of many of yours, uh, Palestinian American businessman, entrepreneur, uh, political analyst, uh, Sam Bahor, who our groups always visit in Ramallah and who many of us rely on for his trenchant and incisive analysis, especially in this most dire of times. So Sam, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you everyone for being here. There's a lot of known names and friends and not many faces yet, but uh, great to have you all here. Uh, Sam, uh, while we were preparing to come on, maybe to just get us rolling here, you, you shared with uh, me uh, uh, something that happened just in your neighborhood today, the death of a four-year-old. You want to just share as that is kind of a microcosm of what's happening in Palestine today? Yeah, I can actually broaden that a little bit. Today was a busy day. I, I, I'm part of an organization called Just Vision. Uh, if you have seen the documentary called Boycott, that was one of our films. We have a two-day retreat in New York, and I'm attending online. But I wasn't able to attend the morning session of that because a four-and-a-half-year-old, four, four years and I think three-month-year-old boy, our neighbor, died. He had a sore throat. His parents took him to the Red Crescent Hospital. They gave him some kind of medicine, and he died on the spot. So it was a very dramatic day, and people were in heavy grief. One thing that caught my attention is that at the funeral, a lot of people came out, and I was listening to how people were talking to the father and grandfather in terms of trying to comfort them. And what they were saying is, you know, you know, God help you, you know, hopefully your son will rest in peace. But don't forget, he's one. There's 15,000 plus kids in Gaza who have died. 
and we don't know how many under the rubble. And I just took that home and I just was reflecting the whole day on it. I can't get my mind around how much grief 15,000 plus create because I saw the grief today of one boy and what it meant. And if I wanted to go one step further a week ago, I don't know if you saw in the news, I don't think it made Western news, but the IDF entered our street at 4.15 in the morning and blew up a part of a building. I guess they were trying to blow up a money exchanger in a building and our open market caught fire. The market where my wife basically shops every day, it's where I walk past every day. Uh, we smelled the smoke of that fire for three days. So things are very, very volatile. I also mentioned to you, Michael, today and yesterday that the Israelis opened up the northern exit of al Bire and Ramallah. You guys all know Kalendia, which is the major thoroughfare going south to Jerusalem. There's some construction happening there. It's always a mess, but now it's even more of a mess. So the Israelis had closed the northern exit of the city since October 7th. Two days ago, they decided that they're going to open that road. It's like a 500 meter road, it's no big deal, but it's a major way to get out. And they did open it at nine o'clock in the morning. And I think 9.40, it closed. The settlers came down from the settlement and literally forced the army to close a road that they had taken a decision to open. Today, they tried to open it again. Not only did the settlers close it down again, but they did fire to a lot of the fields in the northern part of al -Bire. So I don't know if the media shows it, but today there's a lot of smoke uh, pillows coming out of the, uh, the al -Bire area. This is nothing compared to what's going on in Gaza, but it's a reflection of there is no place in Palestine safe today, nowhere. It's only a magnitude of what we're facing. We were going to get to this, but as long as you brought this up, Sam, uh, um... Um, the statistics are staggering, right? 40,000 Gazans killed, 75,000 wounded, 40% of them children, 85% forced from their homes, 70% of homes demolished. Uh, uh, but each one of these is a unique individual. I mean, they're not statistics, right? They're individuals, uh, um, uh, fathers, mothers, children, spouses, family members. And we, we can't lose the humanity. We can't lose the humanity here uh, amidst all the statistics and, and also the toll on the living. So I want you to just say a word about the invisible bodily traumas, the hidden injuries, the brain injuries, and even more the, the long-term psychological and emotional impact on those who are surviving. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the, 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 the deaths are known. It's a, it's a disaster. We're burying our dead as fast as we can. Uh, we understand that there are thousands, not hundreds, thousands still under the rubble. Uh, the invisible damage is not even reported in a serious way. And we're talking about kids who are left with no parents. We're talking about kids who are, or, or, or adults as well, who have lost limbs. We are talking about the mental impact of what has happened will last a lifetime for this generation. And I recall, you know, I, I was brought up hearing the stories of 1948, and I still talk about it today as a second generation Palestinian. And when I understand that what we're visiting today in Gaza is three times as a, a devastating event as 1948 was, I can only imagine how many decades looking forward, that it will be the focal point of an entire generation or two or three. The amount of damage is not known yet. Remember, no international media, not one, has been allowed to go into Gaza, except on the occasion of being embedded in an Israeli tank, which was very curated for them. War correspondents are sitting at the border waiting to get in. We haven't heard the stories which are going to make our hair rise once we hear it. And the medical equipment not going in is, is you know, again, it's, it's not about Palestine anymore. It's about humanity in general. And I think that when we start to look at it like that, this is not related to October 7th. It's actually not even related to the occupation. 
we're talking about an onslaught of an entire part of a population. That's why there's charges that are about to be brought against uh, Israeli leaders and Hamas leaders. What's happening today uh, is horrific from a humanitarian point of view, from a human point of view. And I mean, there, you know, there's, there's many places one can look for information. Uh, what I'm focusing on now is the classification that we have entered famine. The yeah. pictures and the stories that I'm hearing from the people that I'm calling when I can get a connection because the connection is not easy, again, is horrific. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about those resources and how one can see a little bit of what we're listening to. Thanks, Sam. Um... By the way, I am going to get to the to uh, I have some of the questions that are already listed in the chat. I have those as part of my questions as well. So I hope folks will be patient. When we visited with you in Ramallah in March, it was five months into uh, Israel's genocide in Gaza. Among other things that you said in, in that kind of powerful time we spent with you, two things really caught our attention and made their way into our delegation summary statement. Now that we're eight months into the genocide, I'd like for you to comment on those two. First, you said, nothing has changed, everything has changed. And the second thing you said bluntly was, this is a U.S. war. I, be I believe both of those still stand and have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, if anybody had a doubt uh, in, several months ago. Nothing has changed and all has changed. And this is related to what I'm talking about in terms of the settlers coming down and burning fields and closing roads and shooting people and burning people in their homes. Uh, we have, you know, I, I think I mentioned this when I met many of you. If you did not understand October 6th, what was happening here, there is no way you're going to understand October 7th and what followed. Remember October 6th, the day before this attack, this, that was the high, 2023 was the highest number of killings ever in a year. It was a government that was moving right wing. It had settlers sitting in the government. It was legislating against us, et cetera, et cetera. That entire process from October 6th backwards is what we're seeing today, but on steroids. And the more Israel feels it has impunity in doing what it's doing, the more damage is being caused. But if someone wants to tell me, oh, people are fleeing from Khan Yunus to Rafah. Yes, refugees fled in 1948. Refugees fled in 1967. Refugees in Lebanon fled in Lebanon in 1982, when Israel attacked southern Lebanon, we've been through these episodes before. The change here is that the tools available to us have changed. The tools being things like social media, tools being things like more knowledge of how to tell our stories ourselves instead of depending on others to tell it. Tool, th tools like the International Criminal Court the International Court of Justice, having access to those kinds of bodies, uh, th that's what's changing. So what's coming to the surface is our ability as Palestinians and those in solidarity with us like South Africa is to employ the tools of the world which were made to address these kinds of situations. That's new in our movement. And um, that's what I would say there. Regarding the U.S., I mean, uh, I don't think it needs much explanation. This is not, I mean, Israeli military people are saying, we cannot continue if this was not supported by the US and funded by the US and politically covered by the US and the UN and elsewhere. There is no longer a fig leaf on how the US is managing its relationship with Israel. That fig leaf, if it was there, has dropped. And now it's not about information. We can always incrementally, incrementally add more information and more data points to the graph. But the trend is very, very clear that it, you, the U.S. is part and parcel. And this is not about Biden. It's not about Trump. It's about a trend line of the last 75 years. 
And I yeah. think that's what we need to focus on. We're going to come back to U.S. policy because, of course, that's where we went ahead in September and uh, we have elections. We'll talk about all that in a few minutes. Sure. I've been talking about Israel's assault as a war not only against Hamas, not only against Gaza, not even a war against the Palestinian people, but a war on Palestinian history, tradition and culture, a war against the very idea of Palestine itself. It's a, it's a war to erase Palestine from human memory, truly the definition of genocide. Absolutely. And I, I would go further than that in the, in, in the context of your last question. It's a process. It didn't start on October 7th. The Netanyahu government per se is a government that has created a unit tied to the prime minister's office years back maybe three, four years back, its role is to comb the classification, the, the, the documents that are classified in Israel and cleanse their databases of anything that can be incriminating. That's a unit within the prime minister's uh, office, which has been doing that for many, many years. Why did they do that? Because amazing historians like Ilan Pape, for example, when Israel released a whole batch of documents about 10, 15 years ago, he ran to the archives in Israel, read them, wrote his books about ethnic cleansing and how 1948 actually happened. And all of a sudden, if you read those books now and you go to the footnotes and you find out, oh, I don't believe what he said. Where did he get that source from? It's this book in the Israeli archives. And you go to the archives physically to look at that book or the paper or the minutes of a meeting, you won't find it. Israel... Mm -hmm reclassified a whole set of documents that historians started to write about. So the, the, the covering up of what Israel has been doing is a long-standing uh, uh, trajectory. Again, covering up something very, very uh, dramatic to the point where today it's called genocide. And if it's not genocide, so we don't get tied up in the linguistics, let's pretend it's not genocide. So what is it? A crime against humanity? Is that any better? Or if it's not a crime against humanity, is it a war crime? Is it willful killing? You, I mean, put it in any category you want. It's horrific. And that's what we need to be looking at, not the semantics, even though the semantics are important, important in international law. But for lay people like us, any category of those categories should be a problem for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh I want you to say, you've alluded to this already. I just returned a couple of weeks ago from attending the Global Anti-Apartheid Conference on Palestine in Johannesburg, South Africa. More than two dozen countries with representatives there. South Africa, of course, with its court cases uh, and in solidarity, Ireland, Yemen, so many other countries. The world is with Palestine. I mean, Norway, Ireland, Spain just recognized the Palestinian state. Yet the U.S., U.K., Germany, all pariahs, if not before, for certain now, all pariahs in their support of Israel. Say a word about the international support for Palestine and maybe a couple of other examples than the ones I just gave. Very important point, because that has actually been the case throughout history. The peoples of the world have always been in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom and liberation. More and more countries, states, are joining the bandwagon, partly because the Palestinians started using the tools available to them. So they brought a resolution to the General Assembly, and they passed a non-member observer state uh, status, which allowed them to have an instrument within international law that people can vote on. Uh, 138 countries voted on that. They created a mechanism for statehood to be recognized. Today, 145 bilateral countries, bilateral relationships recognize the state of Palestine. So if you look at a map, there is one, actually I saw it uh, a couple of days ago, which shows the uh, uh, countries in the world who are recognizing the state of Palestine. You basically have the U.S. and a couple dots around the world. The rest of the world is on board. So what South Africa did was very important because not only is it their obligation it's not a, it's, we're not playing a game. These are international obligations if you're a signator to the International Criminal Court of Justice. 
They upheld their obligation, which many countries joined the bandwagon and signed on to what they did by holding, by bringing this case in front of the International uh, Court of Justice. We should not forget that there's another process happening at the International Court of Justice, which was brought by a General Assembly resolution in November of, I think, 2022. And it only came to the surface and it got mixed up with what's going on in Gaza because it's not related to Gaza, it's related to the entire issue. The Palestinian side had requested that the International Court of Justice gives a advisory opinion on the legality of the occupation itself. I'm a very cri big critic of the Palestinian leadership. I mean, right. I don't see them doing the right thing. In this specific case, I give them credit. So much so that I actually put the link on my blog to their presentation because they were, they were the first to speak to bring this case of the illegality of occupation. For three hours, a set of lawyers presented the Palestinian struggle from its beginnings till today. And I think it's the best three hour lesson one can see to hear the entire story succinctly. Um, and so I do think that what South Africa did and what the Palestinians did by asking for an advisory opinion that we're still waiting for the result of is, is key. Again, using these new instruments that we have all become uh, uh, aware of. South Africa has a, a double whammy here. Not only are they doing what they should do as someone upholding the law, but they're also benefiting from this new multipolar world that nobody exactly knows how, this, how the dust will settle yet. They are creating themselves as a leader of the South within that equation. And I think that's something that we'll be reading about many years in the future. You've alluded to this as well. Um, our attention is rightly directed to Gaza, but less reported is the ongoing oppression, ethnic cleansing, uh, slow uh, uh, but inexorable genocide happening in the West Bank under the cover of Gaza. Uh, you mentioned the settlers uh, and uh, closing the road at Albira and lighting fires and all the rest. Uh, share some other examples from throughout the West Bank. Many of us have traveled to many of the Palestinian towns around the West Bank. Share some other examples of this slow motion but inexorable genocide in the West Bank. I'll give three examples. One, it's happening mainly in the north, but not only in the north. It's happening in Jericho as well. The Israelis are entering refugee camps under the auspices of wanting to arrest someone. We're used to that. And anybody who's has heard me speak for the last 20 years, I've been talking about that's what we hear in the morning on the radio every single day, how many people were arrested the night before. But now, uh, a little bit before October 7th even, there's a new way that they enter the camps, specifically the camps. They're bringing bulldozers with them and uprooting the streets and the infrastructure of the camps alongside arresting people and killing people, physically killing, shooting people in the streets. That has been devastating because once the army withdraws from a camp, the camp needs months on end to recover from a single incursion. And that's something that we've seen increasing more and more after October 7th, the amount of destruction done, not only the physical killing, but the, the physical destruction of infrastructure and very purposely, of course. When I say they updo, a, they uproot a road, it's not only the road, it's the road and the sewage system and the water system and the gas yeah. system, it's everything. So that's one very clear trend that we can see and the UN is documenting this in a very serious way. The other is arrests. Arrests have always been an issue. Palestinians are arrested under what they call administrative detention. So what I'm doing with you right now is classified by the Israelis as incitement. I can be picked up tonight at four o'clock in the morning and sent to jail with no questions asked and no charges brought against me for six months. That The number of people who were held before October 7th under administrative detention was around, I think, 1,400 people. Today, it's surpassed 7,000 Palestinians that are under administrative detention. Uh, more than six months. Some of them are coming out these days because six months has passed. Some of my friends 
one uh, Arabic teacher at the friend's school who taught my kids came out of prison. I didn't know him by how much he deteriorated in those six months. The stories that we're hearing from the Palestinians is, if I can say it in one sentence, they tell me, you know, there's, the, the prisoners is actually a prisoner movement. There's a whole long history of prisoners. They say everything that our prisoner movement got by blood, sweat, and tears over the last 40 years was taken away overnight. They are being treated like animals. And remember, they have not been charged with anything. Yeah. Uh, and so that's another theme that I think is important to keep in mind. Uh, and the third one I want to give you, it's also something I speak about when I talk to you guys when you come here, is the invisible part of the occupation, the administrative part of the occupation. The Israeli finance minister, Bezerel Smotritz, this fascist settler, who's in charge of the finances in Israel and in charge of the money that comes from the Israeli ports, or the custom fees that Palestinians pay, gets transferred to the Palestinian Authority every month. And Israel takes 3% out of that. That's what's supposed to happen. Over the last several years, they've been taking millions of shekels out of our own money, saying that we owe hospitals and we owe this and we owe that. About 10 days ago, Smotrich said, I'm server severing the ties. You will receive none of your money, zero. And, and I sit on the board of a bank, so I'm watching this firsthand, that I'm severing all of the connectivity between Palestinian banks and Israeli banks. Why are those two things important? The custom fees, our custom fees, that we pay to the Israeli Port Authority, which is transferred to the Palestinian Authority budget, the government's budget here, is about 65 to 70% of the operating budget of the Palestinian government. So they're about to collapse. I would say they're already collapsed, but they're just not saying it publicly. The other important thing is, by design, we're not allowed to have a direct connection to the outside world. Not for people. When you visit me, you come through a checkpoint. Not for goods. Goods have to come through Israeli ports of entry. And not for banks. Banks are not allowed to operate here unless they go through a, what we call an Israeli corresponding bank. By saying you're going to server the ties of the banks, then business will stop as well. Who's making a big deal about this? Interestingly and ironically, the, the Israeli companies. They're holding Palestinian checks and they're telling their finance minister, what are you going to do? You're going to sever the ties? So the, the, the value of the checks that I'm holding because I sold the Palestinians something will be zero. So they're, they're, the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. It is an ideological approach to politics, which is very, very dangerous. I have a, a hang with me here with this question. It's in two parts. And the first one's a little bit uh, longer. And then the second one comes from uh, the chat room. So one of the most frustrating things for us who stand with Palestine is the absolute bias of the Western media in parroting Israel government propaganda. Uh, add to this Israel targeting Palestinian journalists and media workers. According to the last uh, Committee to Protect Journalists report released yesterday, at least eight, 108 murdered since October 7th. <laughs> so in addition, in addition to uh, medical personnel, we really do have to add those Palestinian journalists, photographers, bloggers reporting from Gaza these days as, as, as heroes. So there's a war on truth. So I want that, that's I want you to talk about the war on truth, uh, this propaganda offensive. And then secondly, uh, from uh, you mentioned Terry Doherty uh, before we got on the air and Terry, uh, who's here, asks, he says, Sam's an expert in Palestinian cell phone and internet communications. What is the status of Israeli control of communications? So th they kind of connect together. Address both of them. Definitely there's a war on truth. Journalists are one factor. Uh, medical professionals are one factor. Uh, you name it. I mean, you name the cluster. It's being decimated uh, by is the Israeli military. Um, journalists are a special case because while they prohibit journalists from entering, they're killing the journalists that are there. 
So it's clearly that they don't. It's clear that they don't want a, another narrative to come out from the ground level. In addition to that, so we don't miss the West Bank. The West Bank is under the same kind of control in terms of media uh, that uh, Gaza is. Not and Israel itself is under the same kind of heavy-handed Israeli control. In Israel itself, Al Jazeera, which is the main covering now because they are they had media in Gaza before their war started, has been made illegal in, in Israel. So Israelis are not seeing the pictures that many of us are seeing. In the West Bank, journalists are not only getting killed, but they're getting arrested under administrative detention as well. So it's a, a broad scheme. It's a scheme that we have been talking about for so long that what we feel is that when October 7th happened, that horrific day happened, Somebody in Israel just pressed a button to implement a plan that was on the books and they were doing it in slow motion. They got the opportunity to do it in fast motion. It's the same book that we've been talking about and seeing and living. It's just happening again on steroids. In terms of uh, the cell and telecommunications in general, in Gaza, there's a lot of damage to the uh, telecom network. We can, I make about 30 calls to get one connection sometimes, if it works. Uh, to give you a feel for Gaza, Tautel, the company I helped create, I'm no longer with them, uh, but they had a transformer that was hit by the Israeli military. So they called the Israeli military through whoever they call and coordinated with the Israeli military to allow five technicians in one car to go fix the transformer because people needed to call an ambulance if they had to call an ambulance. They sent them out. They told them, you have to take this specific route. You take a right here. You take a left there. You use this road. You finish your work, and you come back. The five technicians reached the transformer, fixed it, got in the car, turned around to come back to wherever they were staying. No one knows if they took a wrong road or if they were on the right road and were hit. The, the, uh, the, the car they, they were in was bombed. Two people died. Three people were injured. So trying to keep the communication network up is a life and death situation. In the West Bank, it's less intense. And overall, both in Gaza and the West Bank, the Israelis want the communications network to stay up and running. Why? Because they are the most sophisticated in the world in surveilling through telecommunications. So for them, and I've said this many times in past episodes, our communication networks usually don't go down. Gaza is going down because they're destroying an entire society. But even then, they ask the technicians to go fix it because they understand that that's part of their military strategies to be able to surveil Palestinian communications. There's a question about uh, any information you can serve as proof that IDF kills unarmed civilians. I think you just gave one example. Do you have others? I don't need to give from my side. I would point to not only the case in the ICJ, which has, brought, if you read their 180 page uh, document, it has many specific over cases. Over and over and over and over again. And if you actually look at some of the cases that some of the mainstream media is covering, even if they don't have people there, like Rajab al Hind, Hind Rajab, this, I think she's six years old. I'm not, I don't recall the, the age exactly. Um, who was in a car that was bombed in Gaza and her family died. She was by herself in the car, got on the phone with somebody from 911 on the Palestinian side, and he's talking her through being very calm as they sent two uh, paramedics with Israeli approval to go to the car and get her. The paramedics and the girl were killed. So, I mean, what I would say is those reports by third parties, I think, are overwhelming. Um, and if anybody thinks that 35,000, I think it'll reach 100,000 by the time this is all over, yeah. are all Hamas operatives. They haven't been watching the news because half of those killed are kids under 18. Probably out of those, probably 40% are kids under 12. If we start thinking that kids from 0 to 12 are Hamas operatives, that's problematic on how we view a full population. Note that the killings are matching the percentage 
of those kinds of categories in the society. So it's a societal onslaught. It's not a targeted, you know, military conflict only. Here's a question from the chat room that something I don't know anything about. Talk about surveillance and use of lavender AI. Lavender AI is an interesting. It was broken by a story that the organization that I'm part of, Just Vision, uh, was part of. Uh, we have an operation inside Israel called Local Call which is a Hebrew investigative reporting outfit. And they broke a story and it was translated in 972, I believe, which talked about how Israel uses a, uh, a system to maintain, they actually, were, there were two reports within a short period of time. One of them was a system of AI, which is how Israel selects targets. Before, in the old days, they used to have intelligence where they see Michael's doing something wrong and they put him on a list and they check him out and then they go kill him. Today, it's about AI. They have AI working and one of the examples they give is they're, they're monitoring specific WhatsApp groups. If you happen to join that WhatsApp group, you get put into the AI system and you become a target. Not only that, uh, there's a, another system related to that called Is Daddy Home? And they wait for the person who they're looking for, maybe a Hamas operative, to go to his house with his kids and wife and so forth, and then bring the whole building down on his head. Because they say that's the only way we can confirm that we killed him when he's home. So purposely killing surrounding people because they want a military target. I'm not a military man and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm learning a lot about the uh, engagement in war and what you're allowed and not allowed to do. Israel is being charged with genocide with no light uh, 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 charges coming against it. Um, remember, the, 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 whole, the whole court, the whole uh, head of the court, these are not people in the Palestinian Solidarity Committee. This is part of the system which doesn't go after uh, mainstream, white, uh, US-aligned uh, countries. When they do understand something is very, very wrong. And I think that's where we're at right now. Time will tell how many uh, is, uh, civilians were killed, the magnitude of destruction. You mentioned one thing about the, the cultural and archeological. New York Times had an excellent article a couple of days ago where they talked about the archeological destruction that has happened yeah. in Gaza. And it's mind boggling. I learned so much from what they wrote with old pictures and today's destruction, some of those things I didn't even know were there. There was a whole history in Gaza, which is destroyed. And I don't know if you saw the clip of the, so the Israeli soldier sitting in a library, lighting the bookcase behind him and sitting pretending like he's reading a book while he's destroying the entire library. These kinds of horrific pictures, sick pictures, I think are just a microcosm of what's really happening on the ground. I want to transition uh, a bit, Sam. I, I want you to comment uh, and give us your take on the so-called so-called bold Biden ceasefire proposal. You know, uh, Democrats are lauding the president for stepping in with his plan, right, to end the war, getting props because he's bringing supposedly two reluctant partners partners to the table, something neither side wants again, supposedly. Although it, it has many elements Hamas agreed two months ago, um, of course, he could have simply just stopped shipping weapons to Israel, right, if, if he was serious about ending the war. He, he's trying to have it both ways, appease his Zionist base and his own Zionist instincts, while at the same time not lose any of the rest of his, you know, Muslim, Arab, uh, progressive Democrat base during election season. G give us your analysis of the so-called Biden ceasefire plan. I've you can tell I'm cynical, right? You can tell. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been me. living in Palestine for 30 years. I don't think I've lost my English skills up until now. So I listen very carefully when the president speaks. And when he says that I'm presenting a plan that Israel produced, that's the first place I stop. What are you doing playing spokesperson for Israel? Is that your job? That's number one. Number two is when you're telling the, uh, the public that I'm presenting a plan that Israel produced and I'm calling on Israel to accept it, 
Am I stupid? <laughs> How stupid do you think people are? Um, so I, I think that what he, if you just listen to the words that he says, there, there's no logic in, in the train of thought. Um, I believe he's playing uh, domestic politics in Palestine, in Israel, I'm sorry, in the US and in Israel. He has no concern for Palestinians whatsoever. And that if he did, he has so many tools available to him to pressure the Israelis to stop. Uh, if not stop, do something different, not genocide. However, I think he's playing on the U.S. domestic politics because for the first time in history, the Palestinian issue is becoming a presidential race issue. That has never happened before in electoral politics. Sadly, it's coming on the backdrop of October 7th, but actually October 7th is past. We're talking about what happened after that. And I think for the first time, they're feeling, the establishment in the Democratic Party is feeling that they the leadership is somewhere and their base is somewhere else. And the university movement is one of those bases that they're seeing moving. He's also playing uh, domestic Israeli politics. Israelis are have moved right wing. That's not new. That's not October 7th. That's a long time in the making. However, with what Israel has done in 2003, trying to do the judiciary overturn, has ticked off more than half of the Israeli population, even a big part of the right-wing Israeli population. But they have not been able to unseat Netanyahu. The way the Israeli electoral system is set up, um, very small parties have a lot of influence. And that's why you have some very small fascist parties. Those are words coming out of Israeli mouths, not mine that have been part of this Netanyahu government, and they're holding it up. So basically, I think they're trying to get a, a scapegoat for genocide. And the U.S., and you can see Schumer did this as well when he said that Netanyahu should leave the scene. What they're trying to do is to build up that the bad person here is Netanyahu. And right. if we can just get rid of Netanyahu, everything will fall back into place. A kinder, forget, gentler, a, gen a, kind, yeah, a kinder, gentler genocide. They forget a genocide happened. An entire population, let alone the world, has seen this live. We've never seen genocides live before. A genocide live. And one thing I want to note here, because people say, well, you're not the first genocide. There's Syria, there's Afghanistan, there's Iraq, there's Sudan. Yes, those are very, very dangerous places that had a lot of damage done to them. The difference is we've been building a, mo a movement of solidarity for the last 40 years, literally, and I've been part of it. And that 40 year movement was ready to act on, a, on, on a, to, to, to move on a dime. And they did when the opportunity, not only this opportunity, in 2014, the solidarity movement acted without anybody telling them to act. In 2008 and 2009 under Obama, when Israel attacked Gaza, they did the same thing. The solidarity movement rises because there's a foundational setup for them to rise. Sadly, Syria, Sudan, Yemen, uh, Iraq, they didn't have that base in the US. So yes, we're not the first genocide to happen, but they were the first one that's being seen live and has a foundation of solidarity. You guys are all part of it, which is there to make sure that it doesn't go past without people seeing it and being held accountable, starting with our own politicians in the US, going all the way to Israel and the Palestinians if they've done wrong as well. Let's let's pick up on that. Um, um, not since Vietnam, may, maybe in the Black Lives Matter protests and the Occupy movement, but not since Vietnam have we seen our young people, the students, uh, uh, leading the way, really, in terms of moral outrage, organizing, mobilizing for a different way of doing politics. Something's different now. They see the hypocrisy. Uh, the U.S. House passing sanctions against the ICC, uh, the leadership of the House and Senate inviting the Prime Minister of Israel to speak before joint session uh, this summer. In some ways, we're not surprised. In other, in other ways, we're horrified at what's happening with our government. And yet these students are leading the way. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, before your daughter, Nadine, who's a graduate student now at Harvard, being part of that process. 
talk to us about what Nadine's up to, but also talk about the broader movement that's happening on our campuses in the US. This is a continuation of what I was saying before in terms of the building of a foundation over many, many decades. Uh, that was happening at the university level as well. And a lot of elements played a role into that. The church community played a role. The uh, boycott divestment sanction played a role. The uh, ongoing onslaughts are mobilizing on a continuous basis every time bringing more people under the tent of Palestinian solidarity. That came to fruition at the universities, not any universities, the elite universities, the universities that actually end up sending people to the government and to business in terms of leading those sectors in the future. That was significant, but it didn't come out of a it didn't come down from a parachute. It came from a grassroots movement that was built up over the years um, within the university system. Also, and this is something I have a discussion with my daughter all the time, the Gen Z factor played a role. The Gen Z factor, and within that Gen Z factor, you have Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, and Palestinian Americans who are more Americanized. They're not like my dad, who was always fearful to be outspoken because of the backlash. And he left the backlash when he left Palestine. He wasn't going to the States to, to, to face another backlash. He was always self-censoring himself. The younger generation who was born in the US no longer is self-censoring themselves. They are as American as anybody else. And they were able to raise the issue to the point of having some members in Congress as well. Um, so all of a sudden you have this progressive community, which is no longer on the outside, but are tooth and nail getting into the inside uh, of Congress, of uh, large organizations, um, and you can see, even in the State Department, you're finding some progressive voices, many progressive Jewish voices, saying, I'm not going to be part of this. I'm leaving my career job at the State Department uh, because I don't want to be part of it. All of that together is a consciousness of a generational change, which is building their actions upon a foundation of solidarity that has been built. I think many of them may not have the full realization of how much work and effort went into building the structures underneath them, but that's okay because we're people of today and they've taken this and made it a major, major issue. My daughter, my younger daughter Nadine is at Harvard. My older daughter is at mass, uh, doing her master's at MIT. That's their all, alma maters that they graduated from for undergrad. Both of them are active. Um, Nadine at Harvard actually works on campus with a program called the Palestine Program for Health and Human Rights. It is under attack as well. Anything with the word Palestine at any university these days is under attack. And they work on merging the issue of health with the elements of the environment, here being occupation, and bringing that together to show how human rights uh, and health are actually one. Um, I highly encourage people, I'll put it uh, later, later on here, I'll put it in a link in the uh, in the chat so you can visit that program and support it if you can. She was actually on a podcast a couple of days ago. I'll put that as well, where one of the they, they do a program in Palestine every year for med students, uh, and they spend like a month here. Their last program had ten students from Gaza last year. They they're med students. They're like five, six, seven years into their medical studies. These students went back to Gaza. For many of them, it was the first time they came to Ramallah. They went back to Gaza. A few months later, the war starts. They find themselves wearing white jackets in hospital operations room, amputating without anesthesia and doing things they weren't trained to do. Um, one of those students actually was not able to do a Zoom call because there's no communications that's solid. He sent a series of WhatsApp voice notes so my daughter narrated what the person was saying. He's talking in English. It's a very, very moving uh, personal story of somebody who had a career of medicine in front of him and found himself in this mess. So I'll put both of those links. I appreciate if you see those. It's worth seeing, worth hearing. Thank you. I see a number of I see a number of que uh, questions in the chat room about uh, the ICC uh, case charging the uh, IDF and the Israeli government with crimes against humanity and 
and uh, issuing arrest warrants. So there's a question about that and also uh, uh, the chances the U.S. and Israel are going to undermine the ICC and ICJ cases. You want to just say a quick word about that? Sure. The ICC is a different thing, right? The ICC right. holds individuals responsible, where the ICJ is holding states responsible. That's right. The two things that I spoke about, the legality of the occupation advisory opinion and uh, the genocide case are ICJ, International Court of Justice cases. In addition to that, the ICC is looking at individuals responsible for crimes. Uh, and they are the ones who brought three Hamas officials and two uh, Israeli officials uh, are trying to get arrest warrants for them. It's still in the pre-chamber, uh, pre-trial chamber. Um, so the, the, the request has been made, but the actual arrest warrants have not been. Those are holding individuals accountable. Interesting, if you look at the, the details of how the talk is happening around them and the actual document that the head of the court issued, he says this is the tip of the iceberg. Many, many more can be added. And that's driving Israel nuts, because that means the soldier in the field who was burning the library while he was pretending like he's reading a book can be brought to trial. So basically, the Israeli military at all levels today is saying, wait a second, this is Netanyahu that we were demonstrating against in 2003. We know he's a nutcase. He put fascists in the government with him. And now my life is on the line trying to support his military campaign in, Israel, in, in Gaza. And above all of that, now the court may take me and hold me accountable personally for what I'm doing on his behalf. It is shaking up the Israeli military establishment in a very serious way. The U.S. is totally against what the ICC is doing for very uh, self-serving reasons, because they are in violation of many of the rules of international law, crimes, that the International Criminal Court would hold people accountable for in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in supporting the genocide in Gaza. So they're fearful for themselves. When you have a half a dozen or so senators send a letter before the arrest warrant request was issued to the court saying, if you act, we will hold you accountable. This is mafia. I mean, I'm in, I, I lived in Youngstown 30 years. <laughs> the mafia was very active in Youngstown. That's a mafia-style talk, that if you do something, I will break your knees. That's what he was saying, that senators were saying that. Now that the issue for the arrest warrants was requested, these Republicans are actually trying to pass a bill to say, we collectively and institutionally will hold the court accountable. Biden has said, as I understand, that he will veto such a thing. Why is he so, to be honest with you? Because the U.S., number one, is not part of the court. They're not a member of the court. And number two, you cannot isolate yourself from the entire world and pretend that you're the leader of the world. It doesn't work that way. So the U.S. is in a bind, thanks to Netanyahu and thanks to the Israeli government and the pro-Israeli lobby has hijacked Congress. So Congress is speaking on behalf of Israel instead of speaking on behalf of U.S. strategic interests. We're in a very, very serious new world right now, and nobody exactly knows how it's gonna fall out, but we know what's right and wrong. Genocide is wrong. We know what's right and wrong. The exceptionalism that Israel gets in the US, whether it's from arms, whether it's from funds, whether it's from covering up for them in the UN, all of that is wrong. And it doesn't take much to find enough data points to make that case. Each one can be a lecture in itself. I uh, I have a I, I just have two or three more questions for you, Sam. I appreciate your time. This one's a kind of a nuanced question. You know, many of us here on this call um, are uh, uh, members of churches, uh, Christian denominations that really hold uh, a, a clear vision of nonviolent resistance. You know, nonviolent uh, uh, resistance. Uh, when I was in the when I was at the conference in Johannesburg and, and those kind of things became part of the the nonviolent resistance became part of the final statement, there was lots of pushback because while the church is an important part of civil society, the church is not the only part of civil society. And there is really a, a strong reaction this that says 
we have to hold fast to the Palestinian right of armed struggle. They have a right to any kind of uh, uh, resistance to uh, uh, Israeli uh, ethnic cleansing and oppression. How do you balance, what kind of advice can you give to us who are part of the civil society who want to affirm Palestinian rights to struggle against oppression in any way that uh, they feel is necessary. I mean, far be it from white Westerners to tell Palestinians how to resist, right? I mean, that's the height of chutzpah. On the other hand, we also hold because of our faith, uh, the importance of nonviolent resistance. Tell us about how we might balance those things in our consciences. The key question, and I'm gonna be very blunt. Um, we do not, as Palestinians or any oppressed people in the world, have a right to resist in any way we see fit. The world doesn't work like that. Either we accept that, or either we still accept that international law is the frame that we're working in, or we drop that, and some people have, and say that the law of the jungle is what we're going to work with. I, up until now, I don't know how to work in the law of the jungle. I have a big body, but I'm not that violent. If I'm going to work within the international law, which is not serving us well, to be very honest with you, but it's all we have, it is the collective understanding of how relationships happen. In that body of law, it does say that Palestinians or other oppressed people have a right to resist by armed struggle. Even that is conditioned. That's what the law says. And those conditions apply to us, and we cannot pretend like they don't. Having said that, I want to take a step back and think more of Palestinian strategy. What, and I've maybe used this analogy when I met with many of you, what is the right way for me in 2024 to resist this occupation? Can I beat Israel in their own game? They only have one game. It's violence. That's the only game they know. They haven't played any other game in the world. One game. Can I beat them in that game when I know that the entire Western world is funding them and supporting them and covering for them? Is it make sense that these tiny people called the Palestinian people, number-wise, can beat Israel at that game? I don't think so. Thus, I don't think it's a wise thing to do in order to, if we, if we decide to do armed struggle within the conditions of international law. Having said that, the alternative is not, not to resist. I'm all for resistance. It's not Sam saying resistance. It's a natural output of anybody under oppression, whether you're in Indiana or you're in Gaza, you will resist the occupation or whatever is oppressing you. How you resist nonviolently is material for PhDs and books, and many have been written. We have to become more creative in how we resist. And that was, that's exactly what the boycott, divest, and sanction movement was all about. Yeah. It wasn't about buying our first F-35 so we can bomb Tel Aviv. It was about non-violently levying a cost on the occupier, which was economic and cultural and sports, by telling Israel you cannot be a normal entity in the world if you're going to continue to oppress us. And what happened? The Western world, the U.S., Germany, Israel for sure, made the BDS out to be a Frankenstein. It made it out to be the most violent issue in the world. If you don't want us to do nonviolence, and you don't want us to do violence, you don't want us to go to the International Criminal Court, you don't want us to go to the International Criminal Court of Justice, what exactly would you do under those conditions? You would use the tools available to you, and that's what we're doing. I think it was a mistake to use the amount of violence that, that Hamas used, discussion for a different day, but there was a, a clear mistake, a war crime that was committed. But I want to say something very important here for the framing. And I think we're all being asked the same questions in different ways. What happened on October 7th? Not one thing. Four things happened on October 7th. So when you ask me about October 7th, I have to ask you, which one of those four things do you want me to reply to? From 12 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, there was a continuation of 56 years of military occupation. 
very wrong, very worth breaking out of that occupation. Also, there were 16 years of a siege on Gaza. What does that mean? If you were born in Gaza and you are 16 years old on October 7th, you don't know what it means to live with 24 hours electricity. You have not had clean water in your life. Also, there was a jail breakout. People broke out of that 57 years of occupation. That was kind of expected. I was, as a young starter, I would have never waited 57 years or 16 years to break out of such an issue, right? They broke out. Then the other thing that happened, which was, I believe, a war crime and should not have happened, is civilians were killed in their homes in Israel. That was not breaking out. That was something I think was intentional because of the numbers, uh, and that was problematic. And that should be held accountable to with the theme within international law, which is proportionality. A thousand people dying is a very, very bad thing. 75 years of dispossession, hundreds of thousands of people being killed over that period of time is a much bigger bad thing. And international law takes care of that because they have a principle of proportionality. I believe all parties, us included, need to be held to that accountable uh, baseline. And then we had the war. The outcome of October 7th was the war. Then you had a genocide. or to put it in technical words, a what do they call it? A uh, plausible. A plausible genocide. That's bad enough for me. A plausible genocide. <laughs> what the university campuses are uproaring about, what the majority of the world is uproaring about, is the plausible genocide. Not what happened on one single day within a couple hours on October 7th. If yeah. we can't hold those two truths in mind, that there's something that happened on October 7th, it needs to be held accountable for and there's an entire society that is being destroyed, if we can't hold those two thoughts at the same time, then I'm not sure how I can make sense out of this. If we're only one-minded, then whatever narrative you want to pick is going to be your narrative for the rest of your life. Just a couple more uh, questions, Sam, and then we'll let you get back to your meeting. Um, First of all, you want to type in uh, the link to your blog on... I'm doing that right now. As you <laughs> <laughs> Good. You and I are thinking the same way. This, this is a simple question, but it's a hard question and a complicated question. What is your biggest fear for the Palestinian people right now? And what do you think must happen next? Uh... The biggest yeah. fear. Right now, the biggest fear, there's too many to talk about. The biggest fear is tomorrow. The biggest fear, to be honest with you, is tonight. What, what will happen to, every night? We have to ha answer the question. What will happen tonight? What villages, what cities are they going to the IDF coming into? Who's going to be arrested? Uh, and then the next fear is, how do I get to work in the morning? Are the settlers on the road that I'm going to? There's a new program now on our radio station, which gives a settler report. Many of you probably have traffic reports where the traffic is in the morning. We have settler reports. There's a 50 settlers blocking this road. The settlers left here. If you want to go now, you can get through. It's, it's crazy. So there's a, what I want to say, there's an intimate, intimate, imminent fear of the here and now, whether it's now, tonight, tomorrow morning, how I'm going to get home from work, how I'm going to go to school, et cetera. There is a larger context of a societal fear. Societal-wise, we are collapsing. The government is collapsing. It's going broke. The societal cohesion that has kept the Palestinians alive all these years is being torn apart. That's not a joke. I mean, the fragmentation started in 1948, and Israel has perfected every round to make our Palestinian society more and more fragmented to the point where if I want to go from one side of my city to another side of my city, I question what's going on in the middle. Can I make it or not within the same city, let alone refugees inside and outside in Gaza and Jerusalem and Palestinians inside Israel. So the fragmentation from a societal level is, uh, is very, very damaging. There's another fear, and I'll say maybe two or three more, is the generation in Gaza. Yeah. What will happen 
to the million and 200,000 kids that have missed school, have been traumatized, and many of them are going to be without parents when this is all over with. How do we deal with that? It's bigger than we can deal with ourselves. And then there's the political fear. And the political fear is maybe one of the reasons why Hamas chose to do what it did when it did it. I haven't, I, as you know, Mike, I, I write frequently, right? Yeah. I have not written one word since October 6th, uh, October 7th for the outside world. I've done a lot of writing for myself. Right. Why? Because the two articles that I last published a week or two before October 7th said it all. One was holding the Palestinian leadership accountable, and Abbas was heading to the UN. So I helped him by writing a speech that he should have gave, because if he would have gave that, maybe October 7th would have, wouldn't have happened. And the second article that I wrote was that this approachment that the US was moving with Saudi Arabia to make a deal with Israel, and we were going to be the losers in that equation, uh, to the point where the national security advisor in the US actually tried to publish an article, I think, in the Foreign Affairs a couple of days before October 7th. And he said, the Middle East is so quiet. We did such a good job there. And then he tried to withdraw it when October 7th happened, right? So the, the fear is that after all of these eight months, the U.S. is going back to that same plan. Make a deal for normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And the Palestinians will give them some talk about two-state solutions. And we'll even give them a $320 million port that broke in one week uh, to get them some food. If he was serious about statehood, he would have taken the message from the General Assembly where the mass majority of states said yes to Palestinian statehood. It is being blocked right now by the US. So we fear that the Saudi Arabian Israel reproachment is going to still be on behalf of our rights. And that's what started October 7th, I believe. So we're gonna be right where we are we, eight months ago. You know, that they say, right, I read an article, was it Amanda Weiss or Electronic Intifada or one of them just a couple of days ago about how that really is Biden's dream. I mean, that that's his dream. And he never did dismantle the Abraham Accords from his predecessor, right, to, to buy off these various other Arab countries, but not talk to Palestinians about self-determination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you know, after our series uh, of summer interviews this year, uh, this summer, we're gathering in Washington, D.C., September 23rd to 27th for advocacy, direct action, demonstrations, meeting with Congress and staffers and more. I'd like for you to, to as we close here, do a couple things, Sam. Uh, given it's an election year and all the context that we've discussed, uh, give us our three or more talking points with Congress and any advice for direct action and advocacy in DC. And second, we all come from different parts of the US. Each community is different. Say a word about actions and advocacy in our respective home communities. How can we, how can we really stand with you, Sam, and our Palestinian friends in real and tangible ways back home? One of the reasons I always say yes when you invite me is because I know you guys are not just talking the talk, you're walking the walk. And to, to us, I highly, highly appreciate that. So thank you, to for starters. I, when I, maybe I've said this when I've spoken to some of you. I've always said that the American people, and I can speak as an American as much as I can speak as a Palestinian, the American people in over history, especially the last two decades, should really be giving a plaque of appreciation to the Palestinian people. Because we proved through our struggle that the US political system is broke in so many different ways. Today, I would say that plaque is not enough. The US should actually make a statue in Washington pointing to the Palestinians as proving that change has to happen in the US. Having said that, let me rattle off a couple of things that I would keep in mind. Number one, top of the, top of the list, stop the, stop the war. Enough is enough, stop this, because more of this is going to get just the hole being dug deeper and deeper. Second, politically, get over it, recognize the Palestinian state. You can't be taken seriously if you keep talking about two states and you refuse to join the world in recognizing the Palestinian state. Next, thirdly, we and this is more domestic oriented than it is Palestine oriented, we need to start to decouple 
Judaism from Israel. Judaism is a respected tradition, a respected religion. Nobody should have anything about Judaism to say bad about. And if they do, we need to stop them in their tracks. We have to decouple that, the religion of Judaism, from the state of Israel. If you hear what Netanyahu says every time he gets up, he keeps merging them as if they're one. He adds Zionism to the bucket, bucket as well. We need to make sure there's a clear distinction. And actually, many things are coming out of the Israeli press these days, which are making that case as well. So we need to do that so people can evaluate Israel as the state that it is using the international rules of this world and not try to conflate that with anything that has to do with a, with a person's religion. Secondly, and by the way, that, that decoupling also has to do with international human, uh, international Holocaust uh, remembrance, alliance, yeah. definition. I mean, that's all that part of that debate. Secondly, exceptionalism. What we have seen in the last eight months, it's something Palestinians have been saying for a very long time, but now everybody can see it. The exceptionalism that Israel gets within the U.S. political body is embarrassing, to say the least. Whether it's not applying U.S. laws, not international law, U.S. laws to the relationship with Israel, whether it's funding Israel with arms like never before, whether it's funding Israel like never before, and whether it's allowing tax-deductible organizations in the U.S. collect money, not pay taxes on it, yeah. that's affecting everybody in this call right now, and then the, those funds end up in settlements or end up attacking Gaza. There's actually a campaign in New York called Not On My Dime, Not On Our Dime. Um, I'll put the link out. Very, very important campaign working specifically on that last one. All of it is under the rubric of exceptionalism. Enough exceptionalism with Israel. We need to start treating them as a state that we treat other states uh, in the same way. And then the last two things I would say is also in the mindset of U.S. side is international law. It's important that Biden vetoes a bill, if it gets to his desk, that talks about holding the International Criminal Court uh, responsible. But that's not enough. It's important that the U.S. lawmakers start to have in their frame that they are not mafia bosses, that they are part of a global world. And if they don't get their act together and start applying international law in their thinking, they're going to find themselves in every single sector of society in a bind, in the postal union, in the telecom union, in the aviation union. These are all international instruments that the U.S. is going to find itself no longer accepted in, and it will disrupt, disrupt the entire U.S. society. And lastly, we cannot forget UNRWA the United Nations Relief and Works Agency and refugees. The refugees that we're seeing in Gaza make us all cry. Can you imagine if there was this much attention on the 5 million refugees in Southern Lebanon or Syria or Jordan? Our communities are being under attack physically in Gaza, but also in these other areas. And for the US to come and say, we're going to punish the only organization, which is not a Palestinian organization, it's an international organization that the U.S. was part of creating, that we're going to defund it and make sure it doesn't exist, is very, very problematic. And I think it's something that we need to bring to the picture. This is not about Gaza only. It's not about East Jerusalem only. It's not about the West Bank only. It's about the Palestinian people. That's what's being erased. And we need to bring all the components of the Palestinian people back into the, uh, the frame. I want to say thank you, and let me share the screen again. I want to say thank you to our uh, sponsoring organizations uh, here. Um, so I'm trying to fill the screen. Um, and then um, uh, also, uh, I want to say thanks to Doug Thorpe and Mark Braverman. Thanks to all these sponsoring organizations for uh, helping us to spread the word about our, uh, our webinar series. And then just to remind you that uh, uh, we'll be gathering again 
uh, next, uh, on Monday, June the 17th with Sibyl's Omar Harami, and Thursday, June 20th with Kairos Palestine's Rifat Cassis and Reverend Munther Isaac. Please share these with your friends and join us too. And uh, uh, Sam, any parting words for us? Thank you all very, very much. I can only say I'm, a, I'm an old timer. So for me, the, the driving theme is organize, organize, organize. If we're going to build on this moment and not let it pass, like 1982 may have passed, or Syria may have passed, or Iraq may have passed, or Afghanistan may have passed, we must organize. And today that's easier than ever before because everywhere in the world, every city you're in, there are organizers like you waiting to work together. I would say get active. You're already active. We need to get more people active. And not only in a general sense, but actually in a sectorial sense. We need to get fishermen in Maine active because fishermen in Gaza are under attack. We need to get educators active because educators have been killed. Journalists, the same thing. We need to go into the sectors deeper than we have. We need to get political. I don't have to tell you that. You're heading to Washington, so you're already there. Uh, and then I would say we need to be not only in solidarity with the Palestinians in a general sense, but we need to be in solidarity with the Palestinians on the ground. And that means like you have already done. You visit, but also pick a case, pick a student, pick a city, pick a village, pick a project, and, and go deep into it in your solidarity. Uh, it means the world to whatever you're doing on, that, on this side, because seeing people working, especially from the US, in a more in-depth way says a lot. And I would end by saying, never ever forget that it's the USA that is broken. And if we can fix that, it would go a long way in supporting the Palestinian struggle for freedom and independence.